Hello everybody and welcome to our webinar. This is the first webinar called Building a World Class Team and Organization, the Four Essentials webinar series. There are four parts to our webinar series. We're going to be doing one every fortnight. Uh, this is the first of them. It's called How to Hire the Perfect Person Every Time. And the subsequent ones are How to Keep Your Best Employees, How to Lead Your Team to Top Performance, and How to Convert All of This into Bottom Line Results. So welcome. My name is Porik Berry. I'm the CEO of TTI Success Insights Ireland and One Focus Business Consultants. And my co-panelist is Brian Downs. Hi, Brian. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Porik. How are you doing? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Downs, and I work with Porik. Uh, I'm certified in all the TTI assessment uh, modalities and I also practice as a consultant in the areas of business performance and leadership development. Very good, thanks Brian. Okay, uh, Brian and I have between us I think about 40 years uh, of experience in this field and over the years we've come to a few simple conclusions and the simple conclusions we've come to is that there are um, a few tools that are effective in building a, a world-class uh, team and a world-class organization. Simple tools. And in this webinar series, we'd like to share them uh, with you. I hope that over the last few weeks, you, or over the last few days, you got to read the, the various blogs that we sent to you. They're a good introduction to what this uh, webinar is about and a good notes to have afterwards. And um, this webinar is gonna take about 45 minutes. There'll be Q&A afterwards. And um, we've lots of material to cover. The pace is going to be pretty fast. We have about 150 people registered for this, so you're in good company. Uh, if you have questions you want to ask, type them as you go, and we will get to them at the end. So, without any further ado, oh, yes, at the real further ado, just before I forget, um, this webinar series has been recorded, and you will be um, sent a copy of the webinar um, if, in a couple of days. So, let's get going. You ready, Brian? Absolutely. Okay. Um, if you look at the, the slide there in front of you, you'll see the, old, the proverbial square peg in the round hole. And this webinar series could equally be called how to get the right people in the right seats, doing the right things right. And the first one, of course, is talking about how to get the right people in the right seats. The doing things uh, right are the right things and doing them right we'll talk about subsequently. So today we're going to talk about the TTI DEEP system, Develop, Engage, Advance, Perform, or Discover, Engage, Advance, Perform, and the One Focus Planning System, uh, which is called the One Thing Plan. I don't know if um, you're familiar with the Rockefeller Habits. I only came across it uh, recently. And if you have come across it, I think you'd be as amazed as I am that it's as relevant today as it was 100 years ago. If you haven't come across them, I strongly recommend that you, you Google them and have a read. Um, here we have what are called the, the 10 Rockefeller Habits. Um, what do you think of them, Brian? I, I, I think they're, they're the bedrock for, for any successful business. I mean, uh, you know, if we just pick out a couple of them here, and um, the executive team team is healthy and aligned, the very first one on the list, you know, that's common sense. You know, for for an organization to grow and be successful, they need to be, uh, the executive team need to, need to have good relationships, they need to be in a healthy state of mind, and they need to be moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. um, equally, uh, core values and purpose are alive in the org organization, number seven. Um, you know, I'm sure we all know the organizations and, and businesses that have the lovely, um, signs and reception, hanging reception, <laughs> listing their values and their purpose and all the rest that really that's the only time you'll ever notice them. Um, and, and what he's talking about here is that you know, the people within the organizations from the top to the bottom actually live these values and, and, and live this purpose and pursue it. And that makes a massive difference. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, the, the, I look at, I look at the, number the worth, two. Having a, number two. Uh, Sorry. Uh, if you look at number two there, Brian, everyone's aligned with the, the number one thing that needs to be accomplished this quarter to move the company forward. And that's another favorite of mine. And follow exactly what you're saying. You have a healthy aligned team. You have um, uh, the, the core value and purpose actually lived, understood by everybody, not just a, a thing in the, in the lobby. And everyone knows why they're coming to work. They all know exactly what they're trying to do this month, this week, um, 
to deliver on the results of the organization and the part that they play in it. Um, it's interesting, um, Vern Harnish in his book, Mastery the Rocket for the Habits, he sort of distilled this down into what he calls the four decisions. He talked about this in people, strategy, execution, and cash. And um, um, I like this model because, you know, again, people, the right, getting the right people in the right seats, doing the right things, which is strategy, and doing them right, which is execution, flawless execution. He talks about this in great length. And the fourth, of course, is, is cash, which is the, the lifeblood, the oxygen of any business. And uh, they are the core to, I think, what we're going to be talking about over the next uh, number of webinars. Uh, people, get the right people, keeping them. Strategy, drive revenue and growth. Execution, profit and ROI. And of course, I say cash, the uh, oxygen of the business. And this is interesting. This is the first model that we're looking at of the two. So we'll look at the, the TTI deep model and we'll look at the one focus, one thing plan model. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this, Brian? So yeah, again, all of this is common sense. It's fairly straightforward. We're not talking rocket science, but most businesses don't do it. So just in terms of people, and this is the TTI model, they talk about discover, engage, advance, and perform. So discover, find the right people. Find the, the people that, that, that fit into the job that you have, uh, that, that fit into your organizational culture. Um, engage those people. So have them engaged in their work. Uh, you know, that the internal communications are working up and down within the organization. Uh, and and that, that they know exactly what, what they're supposed to be doing. Advance people. So, you know, bringing emerging, emerging leaders along, looking after succession planning, um, you, you know, it, it's very, very important. Developing the, the, the key skills and attitudes Absolutely. that will that will bring yeah. them along, and, and finally perform. So, leading these people, uh, leading the people in your organisation, getting them to perform to their full potential, um, and again, you know, real a real understanding of who they are and and what's required of them, and and what skills they need to grow. So, you know. Four basic, four basic but key components. It's interesting, you know, if you link them in with the, the, the one thing plan that just popped up there for you, um, uh, there's no point having the right people, of course, unless we agree a, a, a clear strategy. You see there, we have the one thing plan, the model, a hedgehog, which is all about living, understanding and living the passion and the talent, yeah. the inside out visioning, and of course, the strategic trust. And we'll talk about this in great length, how you use this um, with a team who are DEA, PETA, uh, how you lose them, uh, use this with them to help them uh, drive the, the business forward. So, as we said, four webinars, how do I find the right people? How do I keep good people? How do I lead my people? And how do I manage the performance of my people? Uh, in the first one, again, just remember the focus on understanding, primarily the focus on understanding the roles you're trying to fill. There's no point of finding the right people unless you understand the roles you're trying to fill. And this is the, this is the core, really, of uh, this first webinar. Uh, the second one, Brian, maybe you might take us to the next couple. Well, yeah, the second one, how do I keep good people? This is really just understanding what, how to build engagement and develop uh, people so they meet the needs of the organization. Nice. Uh, the third one, how do I lead people? Uh, or how do I lead my people? And that's about developing a shared vision with your team and converting it into an execution plan that they own. And the fourth, how do I manage the performance of my people? And here we're exploring a range of tools to allow you to build accountability, so peer reviews, war room, performance reviews, gap analysis, development plans, et cetera, et cetera, that are all critical to, to, to people growth. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I remember when the first time I read this book, um, Good to Great by Jim Collins. I thought it was an amazing book. And I think that almost everybody listening in here on this webinar would probably have um, uh, hired or promoted or developed and assessed um, a number of people over their careers, either in their own businesses or as consultants working with um, their clients. And if you have, you, 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 we'll all know there's no right or wrong when it comes to uh, ass uh, assessments, no right or wrong when it comes to uh, the personality, if you wish, the behaviors and motivators and confidence what the people have. The only thing that really matters um, is are they a fit for the, the, the role? And in his book, um, Good to Great, Jim Collins talks about this thing of injecting an endless stream of talent into the veins of the organization. And I agree entirely with them. When you find great talent, you should really try and get them on board. But I'd add to this that injecting an endless stream of talent is fine, but you've got to inject a stream of talent that actually relates to the roles um, that you require. 
So that you, 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 you're, you're hiring people, you're developing people and assign them to specific roles where their talents, like their behaviors, their motivators, their acumen, their competencies and so on, their education, their hard skills, where they are used to maximum effect of the greatest impact and where they, of course, are likely to be most successful and to remain um, engaged. And, you know, up here you see here the, the true cost of bad hire. Uh, it, it, Harvard Business Review uh, looked at this whole area of um, uh, in, in an article called The Definitive Guide to Recruiting Good Times and Bad. They looked at this whole area of you know, what, did, what went into uh, a good hire? What were the issues that went into a good hire? And let me ask you a few simple questions. Uh, I'm going to ask you here, Brian, have you ever hired someone to meet your expectations? I have indeed. Why do you think that was? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a number of factors to it, but uh, you know, a bad a bad fit, <clears throat> not hiring the right person for the job, maybe hiring uh, hiring too quickly, um, you know, th there's a, a, any number of reasons. Um, but I, I think we've all been in that position. Yeah, well, my experience has been it's interesting to hear you say that. My experience has been that the the main reason I made a bad hire because I didn't realise what role I was hiring for. Not really. I mean, I thought I did, uh, but I didn't really. And uh, it's interesting, in, in this article from, from, from Harvard, they, they made the point that companies fail to hire and retain the best talent because without an effective recruitment process in place, they inadvertently treat hiring situations, as you said, like an emergency. And they say that about one third of all hires depart, of all, like, well, they consider to be very positive hire, very, very good uh, talent, leave within three years. And uh, uh, yeah. The, yeah, you know, because we all we all rely on things like subjective personal experience. Do we like the person? You know, um, and, or we look at the, the work experience, the career they've had to date, and we take that as the single most important thing. Or we look at their academic qualifications. Um, you know, they, they again, the HBR guys said that the single most important thing in this process that you're in front of you, in fact, is improving the quality of the assessments. And they said that's three times more profitable than increasing the size of the candidate pool and six times more profitable than getting the chosen candidate to accept a lower compensation package. So, so what they're saying here is improving the quality of assessments, understanding the role is and improving the quality of assessments that you use to assess people for that role is really the critical issue. Any, any thoughts on this, Brian? I mean, look. You know, we we've seen we we've seen this in action. You know, and, and we see we see how it works and the clarity that you get <clears throat> going through the process of of, of benchmarking using assessments. But also, you you know, that doesn't mean that CVs and and interviews and and references are are not valuable. Of course, they are. But they're just part of a part of a bigger process that drives clarity and 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 clarity is king here. And what was that? Um, what was that article you told me about? Bits. Yeah, what was that article you told me about, the Wall Street Journal article that you read? Yes, there was a really interesting statistic, statistic in this. Um, they, through a survey, they, they discovered that large companies using assessments as part of hiring in 2001, so that's just 15 years ago, was about 21% of them. And now 15 years later, that's up to 57%. Actually, in 2015, it was up to 57%. I mean, that's a huge jump. That's more, that's more than doubled, uh, significantly more than doubled, actually. And, uh, you know, I, I think the message is sinking in in terms of, of the usefulness of assessments. Yeah, good. But well, let's have a quick look at it. We said here that uh, the, the, the model that we're going to look at that we think can be helpful in this area, this model of DEAP, Discover, engage, uh, advance, and perform. I just want to define it a little bit differently. It, it discovers really about finding talent. That can be finding people externally or finding internal talent. Engaging is really about retention. It's really about how do you keep people, how do you retain them? And that, as you said earlier, Brian, is about matching them to the roles effectively so they're successful in the roles so the company's happy with them. And uh, advance is really about um, uh, the whole area of developing people. And so how can you advance even how to develop people as you said, succession planning, so on. And then perform is all really about the management of this talent that you have, helping them all perform to their best and to um, excel basically at the role. So the true cost of bad hire, just get back to the, 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 the slide that we made uh, that we talked about there a few minutes ago. The true cost of, of bad hire, 80% of turnover, 80% of turnover is because of bad hires. This was, a, this, was a, this was a Gallup survey, and they also said that the, the cost of a bad hire was five times annual salary. It's quite remarkable. 
And another statistic. It's scary. Roger. Yeah, it is scary, isn't it? And another statistic. Yeah. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners estimated that the cost in an SME company, a small to medium enterprise, is €190,000 because of the multi, for, for that hire, because of course the multifunctional nature of the um, of the roles in small companies with people have a lot of uh, yeah. impact you know, they're, they're involved in lots of, lots of different roles. So I mean, whatever you look at it, um, it's bad news. And uh, interesting, just look at the little graphic there. Uh, lost worker productivity, 41%. Uh, lost time due to recruiting and training, 40%. Expense recruiting and training other worker, 37%. Negative impact on employee morale, 36 percent negative impact on client solutions 22 percent so i mean the true the, the true cost of bad hire uh, isn't just the, the actual costs of hiring them it's um, all these other costs if you wish that um are associated with it and this is i'll let you run through this slide this is a good one so yeah why do companies hire bad employees so third, what we're saying here a 38 percent 38 percent now that's a big percentage of bad hires are because uh, the company needed to hire quickly. Just, just think about that for a second. And by the way, it's worth making the point that 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 was that those figures come from a survey, I believe, from Career Builder of six thousand and HR professionals. Thirty-eight percent because you needed to hire fast. Yeah, and that's something that's sinful almost. You know, it, it's it's it just it, it just doesn't bear comprehension, um, and and. The other uh, big statistic that stands out there is that 21% um, didn't test or research the employee's skills well enough. Yeah. Um, you know, I, now that 34%, it just didn't work out. Okay, look, it happens, but you know that seems kind of high to me, to be honest with you. That a third of your of, of your of your uh, uh, 34%, it just didn't work out. Is a bit of a is a bit, a bit of a, a bit of a flimsy reason, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's unavoidable at the same sounds, time. It sounds like a fudgy type um, answer, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, and and but when you look at these uh, these stats here, and the, the last one, eleven com eleven percent, the company didn't do adequate checks. All of these are avoidable. Yeah, and, and this is the really important point. And remember, this. guys, these statistics are real. These are from two thousand and fourteen. They're very very current, and there are six thousand HR professionals worldwide. I mean, uh, I, I, this is your fav This is your favorite line. What do you say? <laughs> hire slow, fire fast. Yeah, it's a great old chestnut. Get it right. It? Get it right first time. Yeah, have to get it right. Okay, let's make the point. And this is, the, this is, I think, the single most important point that I want to make in uh, in this webinar. It is that recruitment is an investment in the future, and uh, and it's an investment that will impact the company for good or bad. Uh, uh, but in performance terms of profitability terms over time. And the initial expense, the initial expense of hiring isn't the true cost. So it's like you eat your vegetables. Um, you eat pizza every day, um, it's only a matter of time that the waistline is going to show what you're eating. The exact same, you eat your vegetables, we lean and mean. It's as simple as that. And these things are revealed over time. You can't lie, your, your, your waistline doesn't lie. And the same is true of the quality of the people you to hire and the performance of the organization. It doesn't lie. The true cost is over time. You are what you eat. And how effective this recruitment process is depends on whether uh, somebody's actually capable of doing the job. So you have to know what the job is first and see are they actually capable of doing it. Um, and whether, whether they're matched appropriately to it, how quickly they can ramp up, by how long it will take them. And then ultimately, the level of engagement they have when they're actually recruited. So, you know, it's um, again, remember, the initial spend expense of hiring isn't the true cost. The true cost is revealed okay. over time. It's worth mentioning here as well that, that using objective hiring criteria helps employees avoid costly mistakes, uh, particular mistakes yeah. that can lead to litigation type Absolutely, situation. because we live, we, we live in a different world. Investment. Yeah, we live in a different world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, okay. there, there is legislation out there and one has to be very cognizant of it. Um, so here, this is, this is I think, uh, I love this slide. The second he quits, just grab the seat and start taking calls. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think early on when I came out of college, I, I, was, I was that guy. Yeah, me <laughs> too. <laughs> grabbing the seat and started taking calls. Um, and, you know, again, turnover is expensive and much of it is regrettable. And, you know, I think this is symptomatic of, of uh, very often how, how, how we hire now. You know, it's, it's just get them through, get them through, and, and we don't give it enough consideration. Um, maybe more more consideration at more senior levels, but, you know, 
very much in customer facing roles, uh, you know, it, it can be a revolving door situation, and, and that's that, that's not acceptable. No, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's worth saying, and it's worth saying here, Brian, that um, using the process that we're talking about here, a TTI over, uh, over the last uh, four years had a ninety-two percent retention rate. So, um, and this stuff works. If we do a property; it actually works. And there's not another point worth making: the true cost of non-performing team members. I mean, this is this is a, to me this is a really really important um, cost, if you wish, that isn't recognised when people hire. And this is this is these numbers here are based on a Gallup uh, study in 2015. Okay. And they're saying that only only 30 percent of of people are actively engaged. They're saying 55 percent of people of employees are are not engaged. And what that means is they're doing the minimum. Yeah. They're doing the, the very basic level. Uh, of work, and then fifteen percent are actively disengaged, and, and this is really worrying, actually, because you know one bad apple can yeah. reduce team performance by by thirty to forty percent, um, and you know if fifteen percent, it's just it, it's a big number. It is, you know, and I mean, and of course, fundamentally, again, I, I want to get back to the point. The, the simple point is, um, you you end up with this: why? Why aren't people engaged? Why aren't people performing? They're not performing because they're not matched the role. And again, you have to understand, number one, what's the role, what are they trying to do? And from there, you can match them up. I mean, if the job could yeah. talk, I mean, what would the sage you think, Brian? <laughs> well, we could ask it. We could, we could ask, ask it, question. Sure, yeah. We could ask it to tell us about the, the knowledge a person needs, the personal attributes they, they, that are required to, to, to be successful, um, what rewards for, for, for performing in the job. What are the hard skills that are critical to success? Um, what behaviours are necessary to perform at the highest level? What are the intrinsic motivators or drivers of behaviour yeah. um, that, that will mean success in this job? Uh, you know, now we, jobs can't talk, but no, they can't. Can so, talk. No, they can't they talk. Acquire this information. But there are. You're right. There are ways, and the way the way to make the job talk is you put together a team of subjects. We'll talk about this in, in, in some detail in a few minutes. You put together a team of subject matter experts. This is what you do. People who have a who have a, who have a, a, a knowledge of the role, who've had a stake in the role. It can be a, an, a, an employer, it can be a peer, it can be whatever, a, a, a previous incumbent in the role. People really understand it. And you ask them the question to pretend that they're actually the job. And on that basis, what do they think the job would require under these, uh, these headings? Uh, because, uh, and even, but even with those people, of course, there's natural bias. And uh, bias is we don't, create blind spots uh, where we don't see yeah. things. Or they can act like, like a set of blinkers where we only see one thing. The best example, of course, is we have a great interview with somebody, we really like them, we hire them. Uh, because Just because their behaviors are the same as ours, we like them, we get on with them. Uh, or um, uh, we look at something like um, education or, or practical experience. I mean, everybody knows of the, the really bright person in a job who's completely incompetent uh, because they weren't matched up to the role. So, I mean, I mean Michigan State University, interestingly, they have, have found that 14% um, of hires made on the basis of a favorable interview alone resulted in successful hires. 14%. That means that 86% did not. 86% uh, were bad hires. Um, so, um, you know, just connecting with somebody, just liking somebody, it, it, it is not what this is about. This is about absolutely understanding. If the job could talk, what would it say under the headings of knowledge, attributes, rewards, hard skills, behaviors, motivations, and so on? What would it actually ask for? And then matching somebody to the role. And, and I was talking to a client just the other day um, who had a really, really strong candidate who was completely overqualified for the role. And, and he, he was really excited about her, saying, well, isn't this a great, a, great, a great addition to the team? I said, no, the person's going to be stressed, they're going to fail, they're going to overqualify, they won't be engaged, the role won't challenge them. They have too many skills be gone in six months. So it's about matching the people yeah. on both ends of the scale, under uh, and over. Uh, you know, and uh, again, one of, the, one of the big mistakes people say is, um, um, Elizabeth, I thought Bob passed away last year. I had him cloned. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so how do, how do they answer the question, uh, when they ask the question of the job could talk, what do they actually say? But they, they'll say, let's take our top performers and, clo uh, and clone them. Or I know what it takes, and I'll just tell you. And they end up hiring people that are like them. Um, you know, that's not going to be good for a business. That's not going to be good for a team. Yeah. Um, I always think, I, Brian. I always think of a football team when I think of this. Yeah. You know, it's the, it, you know, you're in a third division. If you're in a third division team and you want to move to second division, or second you want to move to first, you don't hire third division players. 
You know, so if yeah, you're cloning, we, 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 if you're cloning we, we, what you have. We need first division players. Yeah, you have no idea if the people you have are A, B, or C players. Just cloning them is yeah. not the answer. Just getting more of what you do, more of what you have. So the question is, what's the what are the benefits of matching the person to job? So if we do what we what can we expect? Well, we can see a, a comp, we sort of form a comp. If we do this, we can first develop a comprehensive uh, picture of each employee's talents and potential. Um, and part of the, so, so, so the whole exercise of, of matching a person to job is the end of this picture. Um, you can put development pro as a place for people coming out of it. Um, you can compare current and new staff, so existing people to, to the roles, um, and again, do development plans for them. You can do succession plans, a whole plethora of things you can do. If you can benchmark the job and understand what the job actually requires, what's the thing it's needed, then it's very, very easy to hire. It's very, very easy to, to call through all the CVs. It's very easy to lose your exist, look at your existing team and decide who should I advance and who should I not? Where will people be successful? Where will not be successful? I had, I had a case actually of a, of, a, of a client once who wants to be CEO of the company. And he, was, he was a serious, serious guy in the, in the sales area. And um, at the end of the process, he came to understand that um, he wasn't a match for the role. He would not be successful in the role. He, in fact, he would fail us. And the, the match that was good for him uh, was um, a, a head of sales for the UK and Ireland. And we strongly encouraged him at the time to develop himself on that role and put a development plan in place for him. And sure enough, he duly became the, the head of sales for UK and Ireland. I was a happy camper, very, very successful. And uh, so this idea of, you know, hiring a match for the job, like really understanding what the, what the job requires and hiring a mattress, identifying measurable job, job performance indicators, creation performance appraisal systems, providing onboard, uh, onboarding programs, developing professional developments. All of this comes from initially understanding what is the role and then benchmarking people against us. And if you don't do that, you can't really do it. Yeah. There's no, there's no way I was, I was born to just pay bills and die. And how true is that? <laughs> Um, you know, and, and, and this is actually really important because, you know, you, you want people to be engaged in what they do. They don't want to, you want them to feel like, like that they're just born to pay their bills and die and, and hate their job and hate coming to work because at the end of the day, they're not going to perform. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's going to, that's going to hurt your business. So, I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the slide there, it says job and people at the bottom. You start with the job, you benchmark the job, and then you match the people to it. And then people are happy. They're in roles where they're successful, roles where they're effective, and where they can perform, where they can add real value, where they can be rewarded appropriately. Uh, and, and, and everybody's happy. The company, the company prospers and the individual's profitable. So what is a benchmark? Well, a benchmark, uh, in the good old days, <laughs> a benchmark with a chiseled mark uh, on a piece of stone. And it's indicated uh, with an arrow underneath it, as you can see there in the graphic, uh, where you actually you put in a, a, Q, a quantity of error, a surveyor would put in his measurement tool. So he's always, he was always measuring from the same point. And that's really what a benchmark's about. It's about identifying something that, we can, uh, that's, that's, that doesn't move, that we can benchmark, we can measure people against. Um, in business, typically we talk about best practice, you know, people execution, process, best practice, and so on and so forth. So what can we measure in a benchmark? Like what are the areas that we look at? And I mean, if you see there on the slide, it's a 61 job-related factors incorporated into an ideal candidate form. So if you, again, just look, take a good look at the graphic there. And you see that um, there are four things that we were talking about in that graphic that we can actually measure in a benchmark and ultimately measure an individual against. So we're talking about 12 behaviors. These are how you, how you like to do things. Uh, 12 driving forces, these are why you do what you do. 12 acumen and uh, capacity uh, measures, and these talk about your potential, uh, what's your, your, your business judgment, your business acumen, your potential. And 25 competencies, these are professional companies that you've been recognized for. I mean, we don't measure um, education, training, or intelligence, nor do we look at hard skills. Clearly, these are part of the overall uh, uh, recruitment and development process. But um, the things that we're specifically talking about benchmarking here are these 61 job-related factors, and uh, ultimately, as I say, combined into a, uh, an ideal candidate form, where you have a complete profile of what the candidate looks like. And then, of course, you start your recruitment process or your development process of your internal people based on that. So the first one, let's look at the first one. And uh, the first one, job-related behaviours. What do you think of these, Brian? So I, I, mean, I think this information is invaluable. Um, in, in, in terms of hiring somebody and then obviously matching them to a job. But this gives you an insight into, into, into who they are. And every behavioral style has a natural head start towards performing well in a certain role. Or, and the best case scenario is, is to put them in that role. Yeah. And so 
I mean, the matching process will, will identify the, the unconscious, the gut level behavioral style that comes very naturally to a person. And, and with that information then, their tendencies in regards to the 12 behavioral traits can be compared to the behavioral traits required by a job. And then if they correspond, you've got a match. You know, yeah, that's and, a good uh, thing. Yeah, and if you look across that graphic there, you see there's four things we're looking at. Dominance, influence, steadiness, and compliance. So we're looking at how people deal with uh, problems and challenges, how they influence people with a point of view, how they deal with pace and consistency, and how they deal with rules and regulations uh, 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 that are uh, enforce them if you wish by others by the way that's my graph <laughs> so be careful what you say here brian <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i um, recognize it Barry. you recognize us so, so there we there were there we're looking at the, the behavioral traits um, that uh, that I, that's my to say that's my particular graph and you see you can you imagine me for example um uh, sitting in an office um uh, working on spreadsheets all day i'm over there firing no. gone yeah <laughs> no you crack up I cr of course i, I mean yeah. it, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't suit your style at all. No, it doesn't suit your style at all. So can you imagine if I was fitting into a role like that, how successful would I be? Likely not very successful at all because I, I don't think you'd last more than, more than a, a couple of weeks, um, to, to be perfectly honest with you. Of course I wouldn't. And, I, 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 I'd leave. And if I did stay, I'd be stressed, seriously stressed, because I'd be doing things that did not fit in with the way I like to do things at all. And the company wouldn't benefit. I wouldn't be very effective. I'd be at three at three o'clock. I'd be. No. I said to you before this is my three o'clock story. I worked for a company once, a consultancy firm, and I remember at three o'clock I'd look at the clock and say, oh "My God, it's three o'clock!" And two hours later I'd look at the clock and it was five past three. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, I think we've all been there, part. Yeah, well, there, 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 there's the profile. So, what kind of what kind of job do you think this profile suits? What kind of what, you know, what could you see somebody like this doing? I mean, this is this is somebody who. Who needs to be out there doing things and 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 creating business and making a difference and and uh, and and really really um, driving on driving forward. That's it. Um, a very ambitious person, you know. Even as you're saying, even as I hear you saying this, I'm getting excited. <laughs> and, and you know, you want to put you want to put a person in, in, in this type of person in in a job that's going to satisfy those behaviors. It's going to allow them to best use those natural behaviors that they have. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, I should make point. This is only one measure. So it's like going to the doctor and he does a blood test. This is one, one but you also need an X-ray, an MRI, a CAT scan, whatever. So let's let's look at a at, at a few more uh, assessments of what we can use to help profile the job and profile the individual. And again, this is my graph. So let's just look at this. These are called um, driving forces, and these are why you do what you do. And um, you know, there's six areas that we look at: knowledge, utility, surrounding others power and methodologies and each side of those and um, give a driving force with six areas of motivation uh, and either side give a driving force that is 12 driving forces and if you look at this this really assures the person's actual job they're most likely to embrace and excel at and um, it's you know if you want somebody to be passionate about something uh, and if they are passionate in a role it's because these things are satisfied so in my particular case if you look there and uh, we're saying you know, high resourceful, bottom line focus. I'm always thinking about return on investment, return on time. Does it work? Does it make sense? And um, high commanding, you know, an, an interest in, in, in being in charge, controlling my own destiny, my freedom. Intentional. Uh, I focus on individuals, working with individuals who really want to help themselves. Individuals who can make a difference. Mm. Um, I'm not particularly interested in helping the planet in general. I'm interested in helping people who I think would move forward and do something. And receptive, open to new ideas. So again, looking at my behavioral profile earlier, and looking at this profile here, you see a person who wants to be out there doing business, creating the future, making things happen. Not a person who wants to be sitting in a desk, or indeed sitting in a desk helping people. I mean, I, I wouldn't be a good nurse. Uh, that wouldn't be a particularly good counsellor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't want to come into me if, if you if you'd had an accident. <laughs> uh, Indeed. It, yeah, here's here's another way of looking at it again. This just a wheel that highlights clearly what the driving forces are and uh, gives some de definition of it. Another tool that you can use um, is this thing of competencies. So we talked about behaviors, how you like to do what you do, motivators or driving forces, why you do what you do, and now we're looking at competencies and skills that you've been recognized for professional competencies. Do you want to talk to the slide for a moment, uh, Brian? Yeah, I mean, look, so there's 25 professional competencies that are they're generally agreed to be necessary in the workplace in, in varying degrees and according to the position, okay? But all jobs require a variety of skills. And uh, and how important important or unimportant each skill 
is for the effect of job performance. It's going to vary from job to job, and uh, it may be it may be unique for for similar jobs at different companies. Um, so, for as an example, a high level of mastery in negotiation and project management may be important for a salesperson in one field, while neither will matter at all for a salesperson in a different industry. So it's very important to understand what, what, what competencies are required for the job and then what competencies uh, a prospective um, role holder is bringing to the table. Yeah, and it's worth making the point, by the way, that this is not about being a sleuth or a detective to discover these. Well, the, the, the process and the tools that we have to do this are very simple and very straightforward. And again, there's, a, there's, a, there's my profile, my job-related competencies. And again, you can see self-starting, flexibility, influence the other time, priority management, goal orientation, and so on. And for me, it's all about moving forward, moving quickly, making things happen. So, so again, you can see how this relates to my behaviors, to my driving forces, here are my competencies. They all sort of hang together. And the last one I want to look at just very quickly is the whole area of acumen. Business acumen, there again, there's, that's my profile. So you know, balance decision making, external concentration, internal concentration, and attitude index. And uh, so you, you have a very, very interesting balance there, dimensional balance, talking about how well do you understand yourself, how well do you yourself and others, how well do you understand what's happening out there in the world, uh, how well do you understand what's happening internally in your own roles, and have a very clear view of yourself going forward and what your, what your future looks like, uh, and so on. So this is a really important, very, very accurate, really important uh, tool in helping identify somebody's potential. And there is a sort of a change in the world right now in thinking around the whole area of hiring for past experience as opposed to hiring for potential. And more and more companies are, are looking at hiring for potential. What is the person's capacity? What, in fact, have they got potential to do in a company to, to, to um, help the company grow and develop? So the question then, of course, is, why aren't we there yet? So there we have the Simpsons. Uh, and anybody who's got children knows what it's like. It's sort of exhausting. But the truth of the matter is, is and it has been sort of exhausting getting there, but we sort of kind of are there. And there is a good benchmarking process uh, that matches people to the job and um, that does exist. So I'm going to walk you through it very, very quickly. Maybe you might just jump in and out here, Brian, as you want. Yeah. So the first thing here, the keys to job matching. What is the key to matching somebody to a job? Well, the first thing is you must know what the job is accountable for. You must listen to the job talk. You must eliminate all bias, all personal preferences, all bias, and say, what does the job really require? What is it really accountable for? And once you understand what that is, you somehow or other convert that into an ideal candidate form. If that's what the job really requires, what does, the, what does the ideal candidate look like to, to, to finish that role? And of course, you start, as I said before, by identifying subject matter experts, people with stake in that, putting these people together, going through a process with them, a simple tool that we'll show you in a moment, going through a process with them that allows them to clearly articulate what the key accountabilities are. And with those in mind, eliminating bias, uh, go to and do the assessments we talked about earlier, like behaviors, motivators, active and copies, and so on. Do these assessments and profile the job in a benchmark. Uh, very, very clearly say, that's what the job requires. And then combine that with hard skills and education, other bits and pieces that are required. That's the profile. That's the ideal candidate. That's what we're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the key accountabilities piece um, provide the background then for determining skills, knowledge, behaviours, motivators, certifications, experience, intelligence, and all, bringing all those piece, pieces together. Um, and it, it's a very interesting exercise to do. And bring just this thing called the ideal candidate form. Again, just look at it very, very simply. Um, a position description, the working environment, educational requirements, experience, other requirements, certifications, pre-employment assessments, competency, motivators, behaviour, acumen indicators, Custom pre qualifier questions and hiring managers to you breakers. So that's really where you want to end up, uh, end up with something like that. And again, based on education, certification, salary, behaviors, motors. I, by the way, see salary in there. It's interesting. Um, that should be part of your ideal candidate form. You're looking at, at what you're looking for. Salary can often be a deal breaker. So you can have a lovely candidate, uh, but uh, the salary expectations are, are, are different and uh, it won't work. So let's, go, let's just look at what you end up with. I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine that you have benchmarked the job. Think about it. You have a very, very clear profile of the job in terms of the behaviors, the driving forces, the competencies, the acumen, 
hard skills, certification, very, very clear profile of it. And then imagine you could end up, uh, there's two little lines there, customer focus and self-management from competence and skills. Imagine you could end up with a report that showed the blue dots there, uh, where the candidate actually scores, little white uh, hoop, if you wish, what the job requires, and then that blue bar um, is showing that where 68% of the population fall. So, uh, so 63, 6.3 there is the mean, as you can see. Um, uh, the person scores 7.3, the job required 10. Can you be able to do that for all the 25 competencies, for the 12 driving forces, for the 12 behavioural uh, uh, issues and the uh, acumen capacity? Can I be able to benchmark and compare somebody like that? It's really, really powerful uh, when you can do that. And again, you see here, uh, here's job reward, reward, rewards and culture. So you're not, you're not just sitting there, if you wish, looking across the table at a candidate and wondering, you know, is he the right person? Is she the right person? Will it work? I always uh, laugh when I, I think about the, 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 the photo we often see of the, the, the interviewer and he's sort of got his hands together as though he's praying and he's resting his, <laughs> his, his jaw and his thumbs. Uh, but do what he's doing, he is praying. He's saying, oh Lord, that this will be right. Because the truth of the matter is, he has no idea if this person will be right. He knows he likes him or doesn't like him. He knows that he gets on with him, he doesn't. He's presentable, he's not presentable. He's, he seems to have the right certifications. He seems to be good. But I have no idea if he fits into the company. I have no idea what, what drives him, what motivates him. I have no idea what his, his capacity is for the future. I have no idea whether he's got leadership skills, communication skills. I'm making judgments there based on very, very little. Whereas, in fact, there are tools that can help you base those judgments on real facts, on real research. So maybe we just jump in here and we say, how do we do this? So what you have there in front of you is a key accountability worksheet. Now, this is a little summary sheet. Ultimately, what you want to end up with in the first part of the exercise is a key accountability sheet. So, for, And here's an example of an exercise that we did with a, a client. And... Uh, what you do very, very simply is you get, your, you get your subject matter experts together and you ask them a series of questions like, why does the job exist? So you brief them on the role, you look at the job description, we've talked about it on some level, say, okay, why does it exist? And what are its major responsibilities? What are its major accountabilities? What are its critical success factors? And so on. And you go through a brainstorming exercise, everybody, and everybody's writing on yellow stickies and sticking it up the wall, or you do it like this on an Excel spreadsheet, which is an easy way of doing it. But I think the yellow stickies are more exciting. I remember we did one together, Brian, and everybody loved writing on the yellow stickies. Remember that's sticking it up on the wall. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually a very insightful process as well. And, and, and I mean, I, I think it creates really robust conversations around what the, what the job actually is and highlights people's different understandings of what the job may be and helps them hone that into a singular vision. Of course, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's remarkable. Wonderful exercise. Do you remember that exercise? The first, do you remember the first time we ever did this together, Brian? And, uh, and we had six or eight people around the table, these uh, subject matter experts, and uh, we had six or eight people with completely different views of what the job was. It was quite remarkable. Uh, it, when you start doing this, you, you, you know, and you, and you actually ask people and you see the differences in, in, in their opinion of what, it should, what, what they think the job is, it's incredible. It is incredible. So the, so, so, so the, the process is you sit, you sit this group of people down, you brief them on the role, and then you go through an exercise of asking them questions like, why does the position exist, as I said? Uh, what are its major duties? Uh, what are its major responsibilities? What knowledge and skills are required for superior performance? What are the targets for critical measures of performance, the key result areas? Um, critical success factors, limits of authority, uh, travel this position requires, administrative duties this position requires, interface with other people, other departments, and so on and so forth. And, and you ask all these questions. We, I think we have about 20, 20 or 26 questions or something in our, in our assessment. And you can end up with 100, 150, 200 and, uh, answers. And when you have them all done, again, imagine these up on yellow stickies up on the wall. And then you start grouping them together into groups that make sense. And then when you have that done, you try and say, okay, can we put names on these groups? And you try and end up with uh, three, four, five groups and give each one a name. So you can see here in this particular worked example, strategic thinking and planning, demonstrating leadership, business management, relationship management, reputation management. And then you go through all the existing um, uh, answers that you have, this 150 answers that you have to the various questions. And, 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 and you sort of consolidate them down into these key accountability statements. So on this one here, we had um, strategic thinking and planning, creating and communicating a clear and focused vision and strategy translates into an effective business plan. And so you do that for all of these. And when you've got them done, when you have these four or five uh, key accountabilities 
uh, statements articulated, and everybody agrees that these are correct, that these reflect actually what the job's about, you then rank them. And I usually recommend ranking in, in reverse order. So you say to the, to the team, if we had to drop one of these key accountabilities, which one would we drop? And you label that number five. They, if we had to drop another, which would we drop? And it's number four, three, two, and one. And when you have that exercise done, say, now, of all of these, forget about the ranking, which one will take most time? And this is very, very important for behaviours. So you might have a job that, in fact, the single most important thing, in fact, only takes 10% of your time. And the, the thing is, number five, in fact, takes 50% of your time. It's just the nature of the, of the job. And uh, it's very, very important for behaviours. So, uh, for example, take a sales role. Some sales roles, a person sitting at a desk, working at a computer, talking to people online. Another person's out in the car driving around. They require different types of people, different types of behaviours. So that's really, really important um, to get that right uh, first time round. So the exercise is you get the group together. You brainstorm this. Uh, you brainstorm answers to these questions. You get them up the wall. You, 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 you group them together into categories. You, you give them a title. You write a key accountability statement. You write them in order of importance. And then you allocate a, a time a percentage of weighting, if you wish, to them. And again, it, it, it just go back for a second. If you look at that slide there, of course, you can see that we, were doing, we did this one in Excel. And um, that's just a little summary of it. We didn't excel. If you do it on the post-it notes, you use a sheet like this uh, to take you through the process of grouping it together and um, coming up with your key accountability statements. And then following on from that, once that's done, you can say to your, 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 your team of, key, of uh, subject matter experts, you say, okay, let's go online now. Let's complete these assessments, the behaviors, the motivators, the, the competencies, and the acumen, as though we were the job with these key accountabilities eliminating all our biases. So there are some instructions that you would give to somebody to go online and they do it. And when they do it, you end up with a benchmark. You consolidate what this, the computer automatically does, the system automatically does this. You consolidate what people have said and uh, you can solve them into a benchmark. And you end up with like a summary of what the four or five people have said about a role. You can take out outliers if you want, if you think there's people whose scores didn't make any sense. And you end up with this, like there's a benchmark, talk about the key characteristics of a position, accountability results, results to people, authority, risks, leadership, personal accountability, employee development, coaching, and so on. And you end up with a hierarchy and definition of who each one was. There's the, the benchmark for um, behaviors, for driving forces, and for acumen. And uh, again, we end up with the, the, the little sheet like I showed you earlier, where you get a candidate and, and you benchmark them against that, and you can see the gaps, you can see the differences. Here's another way of looking at it, where you have four or five candidates, and you can actually compare the four or five candidates to each one of these uh, benchmarks. Again, remember, we're talking about 25 competencies, we're talking about 12 driving forces, we're talking about 12 active capacity, and we're talking about 12 um, behaviours, 61 factors that we can measure in total. Different slices, just like the doctor, the MRI, the CAT scan, the X-ray, the blood test, and so on. Different slices, different ways of looking at the individual, they give you genuine insights into the individual. And you can end up with a summary uh, sheet like this, where you can actually compare an individual to the job. And not only that, you can end up with uh, uh, meaningful uh, 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 questions for an interview process around companies, driving forces, behaviours, and so on. So with a little panel of interviewers, you can all take particular areas, and you can focus specifically on the areas where these people are strong, where these people are weak, and where you want to tease uh, things out. So you can see that it, the process is very, very simple, but very, very comprehensive. Um, and again, as I said, you end up with this um, uh, ideal candidate form. I, have I missed something to think there, uh, Brian, uh, in my quick run through? No, I, I think you're spot on. I, 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 again, important to say that how, how simple this is. It's a straightforward process, but the value is incredible. Um, and, and this ideal candidate form, I mean, that's, that's, your, that's your pen picture of, of the person you want. Uh, yeah. That's going to help you write your write your, your, your job ads if, 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 if you're going to go, 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 go down that route. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a really powerful and, and uh, useful, useful process. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I find it hard. Once, I think once you've done it, once you understand it, um, and then you sit down, you look at a candidate that you want to hire, or you look indeed at somebody internally that you want to promote, or a question mark you have over somebody. Uh, without this kind of information, you really, really are shooting in the dark. I mean, you really are. And you should cross your feet and your legs and everything else because uh, you, you need all the luck in the world. Um, in summary, let's just try and pull this together to summarize it and wrap this up. You have to first benchmark the job. You can't match people without first benchmarking the job. You must identify what is the job in a way that is unbiased and that you can measure somebody against. Um, so. Once you've done that under the headings, as I said before, behaviors, motivates, acumen, 
and uh, competencies plus other uh, benchmarks you can use around hard skills and so on. Once you've got that in place, you can then use that um, to benchmark the advertising position, as you mentioned a moment ago, uh, Brian. You can use the screen resumes for hard skills and experiences, conduct email or foreign interviews. You have that information in front of you, just even, the, just even if you had only the key accountability in front of you. That alone will help you screen uh, uh, talent. And then you use that, as I say, for the whole recruitment process, comparatives, and um, when you put for onboarding an individual, if you actually ultimately hire somebody, for putting a professional development plan in place, it's worth making the point that coming directly out of this process, you can actually produce a professional development plan around the, all the areas that we benchmark for an individual, to i.e. showing the gaps that we, uh, against the role and what the development is required for each individual so they can move towards that role. Um, so, I'm trying to think, is there anything, anything we want to say just to wrap up there, uh, Brian, and anything I've missed, anything uh, we think is worth mentioning? No, I, I, I think I, I think we've covered everything there in, in terms of this process, and and it's just to say that there's an easier way uh, of doing of doing that's uh, sure. of, of engaging in recruitment, and and, and that's going to save money, and and it's 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 a, a simple process, um, and very easy to access. Okay, my closing just my closing thought for you folks is this, and. Um, there are four, we believe there are four elements to building a world-class team and organization. Under, when we talk about the whole thing of uh, people, strategy, execution, and cash, we focus on three, people, strategy, and execution. And these four webinars are addressing. The first one was talking about how to hire the perfect person every time. So getting the right people in the right seats. So you benchmark the role, you match the people, and you have the right people in the right seats. And the second is how do you keep your best employees? So if you have them in place, how do you engage them fully? How do you keep them? How do you develop them? The, the, the third um, webinar is how to lead them. We talk about the whole planning process and the visioning process and how you engage people in that. And the last one, we talk about how you convert all of this into action, into tools, it's very, very simple and straightforward tools and systems to allow people to execute your strategy. The right people, the right seats, doing the right things right. So thank you very much for um, attending our webinar. I hope you enjoyed us. Thank you very much, Brian, for, for co-hosting this with me. And we look forward thanks, to seeing you all. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And we look forward to seeing you all at the, um, the next webinar. Thank you very much.